please. Father God, we, we, Lord, we love you. First and foremost, we love you, Lord, above all things. Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for bringing us here this morning. Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for bringing us through everything. Lord, we know that you have a plan for today. And Lord, we are ready, willing, and open to it, Lord. So just lead us and guide us this day, Lord. Let us, I pray, Lord, that as everybody walks through those doors, that they would just take a moment, settle themselves, leave everything outside the door so that we are wholly, fully focused on you this morning, Lord. For you are our redeemer, you are our comforter, you are our strength, Lord. You are our all in all, Lord, and we give you all the praise and all the glory that you are due. We praise you, Lord. Amen. 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 And I will stand in your house, O Lord, and I will sing of your great love, cause I good isn't it good to be in the house of the lord yes there is no place i would rather be than praising god amen yes, yes. give the lord a hand he's worthy lord. hallelujah
truly, Lord, there is no one like you. God, and we just stand here this morning. We stand in awe of your presence, Lord. We stand in awe as we think about your great love for us, Lord, how you decided to go to that cross to pay for our sins, even though we were still sinning, yes. Lord, even though we didn't know you, even though we didn't even want you. Lord, you did that for us. How great, how great is your love, Lord. We thank you for it. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all. Lord, we believe with all of our heart that you will be her protector. 
Yes, Lord. So, God, we just bless you. We bless your 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 country, Israel, your nation, Lord. We ask that you would um, uh, just bring your peace to Jerusalem at this time, Lord. Yes, Lord. And just bring them through this uh, through this time, Lord. We trust you with them. And we hold all of our other concerns to you, Lord. We still ask that you continue to work in Pete, Lord, to bring a healing with yes, his Jesus. cancer. Yes, We ask that you would be with Bob also, God. Yes, Jesus. We also want to thank you for Steve Marino. That yes, you're Lord. Yes, Lord. House, yes, Lord. Lord. This is your place. Well, we want you to be our God, and, and we want to be your people. Yes. So we ask that you continue to speak to us this morning. In the precious name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Good to have you guys. Say hi to someone next to you and behind you. The kids can spot anything. Last little time. I know. Okay. Wow. What a morning. Man, oh man. 
Jen is having a tough time. Christine was very nauseous before sermon, before the service. Israel's under attack. Jeez, man, just one of those days. All the sound is all messed up. But you know what? <laughs> we made a joyful noise, right? That's it. That's it. We made a joyful noise. I think God must have something to say to us today. That's what I'm thinking. So um, it's interesting. Um, this coming Wednesday, we're, we're doing a study uh, through the end times, all the end time scenarios. The last couple of things we looked at was uh, Jerusalem being brought back into her land in 1948. We looked at the implications of that being an end time prophecy that that Israel coming back into the land never never has that happened in in history where a nation that was dispersed throughout the four corners of the world is supernaturally brought back into her own land it's never that has never happened but then we also this past on this past Wednesday we looked at the fact that um, Jerusalem um, the city of Jerusalem um, she is specifically noted in the scriptures how she also is a picture of the end times. So we're looking at all that, and then I said, okay, let's go into now all the surrounding countries around Israel. Do they tie into the end times? And boy, I, I, maybe I should have taught it last week, you know, because, you know, here it is. So you're seeing all these things. Jesus said, when you see these things happening, don't, don't bite your nails and freak out and lose your mind. No, look up because our redemption draweth near, right? So that's, that's the exciting thing about these end times, right? It's not to, not to wig you out. It's, it, Jesus wants us to be aware. You know, he doesn't want us to be unaware, he says, right? So have oil in your lamp. Make sure you make short accounts with the Lord. Make sure you're right with him. And um, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. But keep praying for Israel. Um, yeah, okay. So that's going to be this Wednesday. Thursday is the men's leadership study at 7 o'clock. If you haven't been to one, guys, you could still come out. Each study is independent of itself. So it's, it's, it, they're, just, they're just good studies. To come out. You want to be a leader in your house. You want to be a leader at, at your job in the church. These are great studies that we're doing on every other Thursday night. So this is the Thursday where we're going to do it. Um, also on the 21st, um, Sunday, the next, next Sunday, April 21st, it's not a slide. Oh, it is. Wow, you guys are good. Financial Peace University with Kristen Jukes. Hi, Kristen. You want to raise your hand? There she is. Um, immediately following the service, um, where uh, she's going to have um, a seminar, um, it's a good time to get back into that, right? For uh, you can get your finances in order, uh, get your get your life in order. There's nothing nothing better than to have your finances in order. You know, one of the greatest struggles people have in marriages is is financial. So that's one of those things that I think it would behoove you to, to get involved with Financial Peace University. It's really a great, great course, great study. Kristen's awesome. And uh, I, I would encourage you guys to come out next Sunday for that, immediately following the service in the teen room, all the way in the back in the teen room. So, What else? Anything else? And the big, the big breakfast, right? April 27th. Uh, the ladies' breakfast, right? You got to sign up for that one, ladies. And, and women's Bible study. That's right, the 20th. Okay, yep, my bad. This coming Saturday is also women's Bible study. Okay? Yeah? You guys all right? Everything's good? You sure? All right. I think you guys read ahead, didn't you? Getting a little nervous. Uh, does anyone need a Bible before we start? You want a Bible? You can get a Bible. If you don't have your own Bible, we have Bibles for you. You can get one at the end of service. Um, they're free. If 
But how about we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians chapter seven, pick up at verse 10. I entitled today's message, Bloom Where You're Planted. Uh, So we got some things to go through here today. Okay, so let's read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And uh, we'll go down to verse 24. I'm going to go through a bunch of scriptures today. But, but now to the married, says Paul. Now last week we looked at the, uh, the principles of, 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 last week we looked at the principles of marriage and the idea of being single, but now he's, he's, he's answering, again, Paul is answering these questions to the church in Corinth. Apparently, Paul got some questions about how the church is supposed to be working correctly, and there's, there's issues in the, in the Corinthian church, so Paul is now responding to all these questions. So another question is, um, what do we do in our marriage? You know, like we, we got married, uh, I didn't know the Lord, But now that I know the Lord, do I stay married? Because this person really doesn't know the Lord, right? So obviously, that's a concern. Do I get out of the marriage? What do I do? Do I stay in the marriage? This is now Paul's, what he's addressing, okay? So you got an idea? Now to the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And to a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? But as God has uh, distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, uh, and, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you could be made free, rather use it. For he, he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. And likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. But you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Father, again, we pray a blessing over this word. We pray that you would help us to understand, Lord, and and, and be given uh, the wisdom on how to tread, Lord, in, in these tough verses, God. We pray that you would just... Reveal your, your truth to us, Lord, so that we might learn from it or maybe we can be a help to others around us, Lord. We, we, we need today's word, Lord. And we ask that you would teach us and guide us through it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so last week again, we, we spoke about singleness. Paul would say, you know, I, I, w- I wish that you would be as I am, right? 
But now, just look down at verse 29 uh, for one second, because I think verse 29 is kind of where Paul's heart is through all these teachings. I think verse 29 in, in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians is what Paul is summing up. He's, su he's summing up his life. And he says there, this I say, brethren, uh, that the time is short. I think that's at the heart of a lot of what Paul is teaching here, that the time is short. So when he says, I wish that you would be remain single, I think you plug in there, why? And the time is short, right? You, you, you're married and, and you're, you're, you're tracking towards a divorce. Maybe try and stick it out. Why? Time is short. You, you follow what I'm saying? And, and this, I think, is where Paul's heart is at. He's, he's writing to the Corinthians that, that their lives are short and that we need to really be careful and, and, and really consider uh, the lives in which we live because, because time is short. Marriage to Paul, you know, if you get married, it, it may get in the way. If, if you're sold out, if you want to just do a work for the Lord, then sometimes it's better to be alone. And do that work alone because, again, we looked at that, all the freedoms that you have when you're not married. You follow? But now Paul's writing to the church that is married. What about if you are married? Paul says now, again, in, in verse 10, he's saying, I command, and he says, yet not I, but the Lord. Notice that in verse 10. He's saying that this teaching that he's giving to us is coming to us from the Lord. And he says the wife should not depart from her husband. So we're going to learn some things that Jesus didn't fully teach on in his three years on earth. Jesus did not fully develop everything that we, that we need to know as Christians. That's why we have the letters. That's why we have the epistles. That's why we have the other teaching to fully develop the full round scope of what marriage is and, and how a church is supposed to operate in the realm of marriage. So Jesus did say, and he did fully teach on a couple of things, obviously in marriage, like in Matthew 19, where Jesus says a man shall uh, leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he says, you're no longer two, but you're one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So right there, where Jesus says, let not man separate or divorce, Jesus says, you don't do that. And he says, this, this, this was the ideal, you have to understand, when Jesus says this. This is the ideal. Stay together. But sadly, we know that we live in what? A fallen world with fallen people. Even Christians can be fallen, you see, like in their understanding of, of, of that the time is short and you want to stick together and you want to show everybody around you what it means to live in a Christian home. But unfortunately, we, we're flesh, and, and, and we, we cave, we, we, you know, it's about me and, you know, she's not making me happy and he's such a jerk and, you know, and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden we get divorced, but the Lord says, don't do that. Don't get divorced. Stay together. The ideal is to stay together. But again, we sin, we break God's laws and we really mess things up. So divorce is made available because God knows how, how hard adultery can be. Adultery betrays the marriage. Adultery betrays the, the trust that some people have for decades and decades. They've been married for decades, and all of a sudden, just one stupid night, and you can just blow up your marriage and blow up your life and you know, destroy your family. For what? Because it's the flesh. Because it's the flesh. Jesus refers to Moses. He said in Matthew 19, 8, Jesus says, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, he permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Yet Moses permitted you to get divorced. But that's not the way that the Lord laid it out at the beginning. The two shall become one, period, forever, one flesh. But 
Jesus says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So I know there's a thousand questions going off, right? Because some of you are divorced. You're looking at a divorced man. <laughs> I was 22. I didn't know what I was doing. I got married, right? I got, I got divorced, right? I, wasn't, I didn't know the Lord. And I trust the Lord where he says every manner of sin will be forgiven you except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I trust the Lord that my sins are forgiven me. I didn't know what I was doing. That doesn't make it right. Right? There should be a repentant heart always. Right? You know, I, I, I want to keep what the Lord is saying there. Right? I don't want to give anybody off. That, there's a loophole. You know? No. I want you to feel the pressure that the Lord really hates divorce. We have to look at it that way. God hates divorce. But there are certain situations. So I know that I'm treading a line here. I'm going to make some of you happy. You know, like, whew, thank God he said that. And some of you are going to be like, that's wrong. That's not the word it says. You know, so, so I, I know I'm, I'm, I, I'm not going to win either way. So I'm, not, I'm just going to do what I think the Lord wants me to teach. God hates divorce, says in Malachi 2.16. For the Lord God of Israel says he hates divorce. And why does the Lord hate divorce? Because marriage is supposed to be a reflection. Our marriages are supposed to be a reflection of God's relationship with us. You see, God loves us, and God will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? Amen. He's the husband. We're the bride. He will never divorce us. We're supposed to reflect that to the world. Husbands, don't leave your wives, right? Be a reflection of a godly marriage to the world around you. You represent God. You see, we, we get so myopic. It's about my life. It's about me. It's about my happiness. It's about my... Uh. It's bigger than that. It's way bigger than that. When we leave each other in divorce, especially as Christians, we just send a horrible message to the world. If we, Christians, divorce, what does that say to the people around us? Now, what happens if that separation or that divorce happens? What's your options? I see two options in verse 11. If she does depart, let her remain unmarried. Or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband, uh, and vice versa, is not to divorce his wife. Divorce within some biblical context is justified, You can't divorce just because, again, your, your husband is just a jerk. You can't do that. <laughs> it's not a reason for divorce. Well, you don't know my, my I, I kind of know. I know men. I am one. And we can be dumb at times, right? But that's not a justification for divorce. There are times when a couple needs a period to, to chill out. Maybe to be separated from one another. Maybe it got too hot. Sometimes there's got to be a separation. I'm not a big advocate of separating. Just, just said, you know. I'm not big on that because I know that the enemy can slip in there real quick. You know, that little, that little cooling off period where you go to mom's house and you go to dad's house, you know, and, and, and you guys separate. And guess what? The enemy knows and he knows how to really mess with things there. So I'm not a big advocate of separating, but sometimes it's a good idea. Uh, but it's always to get together again, you see. Re rest restoration is the key in a marriage like that, that's on the rocks, right? Restoration. But now Paul says, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, say. Oh, look at that now. I, not the Lord, say. So here we see that there were some things, again, that Jesus didn't fully lay out for the church to understand all the complexities of marriage. Here, Paul is stepping into that role of developing the full context of what marriage is supposed to be. So now you're saying, aha, <laughs> this is Paul's opinion. This is not inspired of the Holy Spirit. You would you'd be dead wrong there to, to say that. 
What Paul says is God's word also to us. It is God's word, not just the words in red in your Bible. Some of you guys are like, well, it doesn't say it. Jesus didn't say it. No, I'm not going to believe it, right? No, no. All of Scripture. Paul's words are not some second-class teaching on the Scriptures. Like Paul is just giving his opinion and we could take it or leave it. No, you would be dead wrong. Paul, Peter, John, the other writers we have are all inspired of the Lord. How do I know that? 2 Peter 1, verse 21. These are holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So anything that any of the writers that we have in the Bible spoke, they were holy men, and they penned what the Holy Spirit told them to pen. You follow? It's very important to know this. Or else we would not have these words in our Bible. Paul's writings of Scripture. When Peter speaks about the day of the Lord in 2 Peter chapter 3, he speaks about how we are to be ready and then Peter says this, and he says, And consider the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, he has written, as also in all of his epistles, 2 Peter 3.16 says, as he, writ, as he wrote in all, notice this, his epistles, and then Peter acknowledges that Paul speaks some things in them which are hard to understand, Paul's writing says, Peter, some of these things are hard to understand. They're hard to develop. But then he says, which untaught, unstable men twist to their own destruction as they do also. Note these words, the rest of the scriptures. So what Peter says there is so important because he's saying what Paul is writing, yes, some of it is really hard to understand. Paul's a thinker. He was a, he was a, 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 a rabbi. He was a a Pharisee. I mean, he was, he had a huge mind. And some of the things that Paul says is really deep stuff. But unstable minds, says Peter, twist as they do the rest of the scriptures. So by saying the rest of the scriptures, Peter joins all of Paul's writings with the rest of scripture. Super important. This is why we can, we can take these words that Paul is saying and say, this is the word of God. And we can trust it. But to the rest, again, verse 12, I, not the Lord, say. Again, when it comes to marriage, remember, Jesus, when Jesus was teaching, there, there wasn't many Christians yet. The church started actually when the pouring out of the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. The early Gentile church had issues that were presenting themselves to the church. And, and, and of course, Jesus didn't fully uh, uh, teach on all these subjects. So what do we do when one spouse gets saved and the other spouse is unwilling to receive Jesus? That's always a, a tricky thing, right, in a marriage, right? Some, it, was, it happened in my marriage. Dawn came to the Lord. I was still a complete heathen. <laughs> I'm being honest. And... And, and she was changing right before my eyes, and I was like, what is going on here? Right? You're no fun. <laughs> Would have been very easy for her to say, you're no fun either. We are not uh, simpatico anymore. Right? <laughs> this ain't working. Right? Paul would say to that spouse, to Dawn, because she knew the Lord, if any brother, that's a Christian brother, Verse uh, 12, has a wife who does not believe and she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. A woman, Christian woman, who has a husband who does not believe, that was the case of me and Dawn, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. I couldn't leave her. Her food was too good. <laughs> it's like, I'll deal with you and your Jesus in time, but... If you're willing, I'm sticking it out. <laughs> now, again, when a spouse comes to Jesus, Paul says if the spouse is willing to remain with the unbeliever, with, with, uh, if, if, the, uh, if the spouse who is not a believer is willing to remain with the believer, then, then the believer is called to stick it out. Stay in the marriage. Don't separate. But again, I, I understand, yeah, we have nothing in common anymore. 
my wife is such a this, or my husband is just, oh, you know, like all these things. And listen, Paul says, stick with the marriage because you can be an influence. You could be an influence in the home. If you divorce right away and you separate because you can't deal with, with you know, with his not wanting to go to church, and I know you guys, you write your little notes and you stick them on the, uh, you know, when he's shaving, he sees another note. I know people that they draw on the mirror, you need Jesus, right? <laughs> and then when they take the shower and they come out and they're, whoa, you know, the shower, you know, it says you need Jesus. It's like, whoa, wow, you, don't do that to your husband. <laughs> don't do that, you know? It's terrible when someone gets saved in a heathen marriage and then, and then sets out to make life absolutely miserable for the unbeliever just to get them to say, you know what, I've had enough for you and your Jesus and, and I'm out of here. And, and then, the, then, the, then the believer goes, okay, bye. Whew. I'm out of that marriage. Now I can go get somebody really perfect from the church. Be careful. Because the perfect spouse that you're looking for may be your unbelieving spouse who needs to get saved and they become the perfect spouse for you. Just telling you straight up. Your unbelieving spouse, by living with you under the, the house that is filled with the Holy Spirit, is in the best place to see Jesus lived out and maybe come into the fold. But look here at verse 14. The unbelieving husband is sanctified. Look what he says there. It's interesting words he uses. The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Now, what's Paul saying here? This is interesting. I, I oftentimes look at not only what Paul is saying, but what he's not saying, right? A lot of times in Scripture, you've got to look at it that way. What is Paul not saying here? This is not saying your spouse or child are automatically saved because of your faith in Jesus Christ. That's not what that's saying, right? Nobody goes to heaven on, another, on another's coattails. Okay, that doesn't work that way. Everyone must make their own decision, their own choice for Jesus Christ. Each person must receive God's forgiveness for themselves and embrace that for themselves. They, you, you don't go to heaven because your husband's a Christian or vice versa, right? But listen, there is a greater potential. There is a greater potential for a spouse or child uh, to come to the Lord when we are good examples of Christ to them in our homes, when we exhibit grace and love and patience and kindness and long-suffering, when we show that to our unbelieving spouse, a lot of times that spouse goes, oh, wow, that's very attractive. That was me. And that's exactly what Dawn did for me. Right? She showed me Jesus. She didn't just like bomb me, you know, get the flamethrower, right? You need Jesus, you know, and, uh, you know, get right or get left, you know, kind of thing, you know. No, it, she, you know. Now, again, just an aside, the, the, the Bible's clear. Just don't, don't get married to an unbeliever, right? I mean, that, that's really a good start, right? You know, again, it. it if you're married, that's a different story. If you're married and you guys got married when you didn't know Jesus, that's a whole different story. But, but really take this as understanding that don't get married to an unbeliever from the start. But if you are already married and your spouse is not walking in your direction with the Lord, then you need to know that there will, there's going to be some pulling in opposite directions here, right? That's what the Bible teaches. I like to use the picture of the yoke right? A yoke of oxen, right? Where, where you don't put an ox and a mule together to pull, to pull right? You, you both should be oxes or both be mules, but you can't be an ox and a mule, right? I, yeah, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Why? Because the ox is stronger, right? And the mule is weaker. And if, you, and if, you know, your, your unbeliever is the ox, which is most of the times, the unbeliever is usually the ox, and you being the mule, you're going to be pulled all over the place, right, by the unbeliever. So don't get married to an unbeliever, right? I know it's hard, but this is the truth. 
But back at Corinth, yes, being married to an unbeliever is hard, but the unbeliever, again, is in the best place to see Jesus. But if you decide to leave, where will the unbelieving spouse see the good life? They won't. So you see, the unbeliever is, now Paul says there, is sanctified. The word is hagiazo. The, the word that Paul uses here for both the, the, the husband and the, and the children, he uses a similar word, uh, for, sanctified is hagiazo. It means to be set aside. Now, set aside to what? Your, your unbelieving spouse is set aside to what? To watch you. They're set aside to watch your life how you're living. So in other words, the unbeliever is there to, to observe how you're living your life in Jesus Christ. And also your kids, as Paul says there, they are holy or hagias. It's a very similar word. But also, likewise, your children are in, in, in your house. They're, they're, they're under your influence in your house. And the kids are set apart, so to speak, for a time for you to pour your love into them, to show them Christ, to, to, to love on them, to, 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 to shine that light in your home, and that maybe, God willing, Lord willing, they will one day say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That's the goal. So we don't just run away from our families. As much as your spouse makes you nuts, we should want them in heaven. Amen? So we do our best, but... Paul acknowledges if the unbeliever departs, verse 15, checks out, then Paul says, let him depart. Because why? Because we've been called to what? Peace. Right? We've been called to peace, right? God has called us to peace at the end of verse 15. You're not in bondage in that situation. If, if the unbeliever wants to leave, you let them leave, right? Blessed are the peacemakers, says Jesus. Right? We're to be peacemakers. Paul would write to the church in Rome, in Rome, chapter 12, verse 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Right? Sometimes in a marriage, you, you just can't live in peace. And the unbeliever goes, you know, I'm so sick of you. I'm so tired of you. I want out. I want out and, and I'm leaving. And you go, all right. We're not going to throw down. Right? You're going to go in peace. You can have your way. Right? But that's after you have exhausted every opportunity to try and show them Christ, right? Pursue peace, Hebrews 12, 14 says. Pursue peace with all people. Sometimes you get a bad deal. Why do you want a divorce, I asked one lady. And she says, when I got married, I was looking for the ideal. Instead, it became an ordeal. And so now I want a new deal. <laughs> I'm sure there's a couple people here looking for a new deal. Right? You're hearing what Paul is saying, and now you're saying, oh, Lord, please give my, give my unbelieving spouse that spirit of fleeing. <laughs> Pour it into him, Lord. Help them to run, Lord. You know, you went to a basketball game with your friend, and you came back, and, you, and your wife says, that's it, I'm out, I'm out. Okay, see you. Go Knicks. <laughs> you know? But you can't divorce over the, the person who's just, just a dope. You can't divorce them. There are reasons for divorce. I got to say it, right? You got to. It's got to be something over the top. If you're in the midst of a physical abuse, you know, some, some people say, no, you got to stay in that marriage. No, 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 get out of there. Physical abuse, no. Mm -mm. Spouse is shooting heroin, doesn't want to go for help, using all the house money. No. no. Destroying the house, no, you got to go. You got to go. There's so many reasons to leave, but the... But the the, the overarching goal is to, is to win them into the kingdom. You see, when, when, when the unbelieving spouse comes into the kingdom, everything can change. That's what you want. How do you know, says Paul. I like that, right? Verse 16, how do you know? How do you know? It, maybe the, the, the wife will be saved. The husband will be saved. Paul says, listen, that spouse may be very close to coming into the kingdom. They may be right there. 
And that, that's always on my mind, like, you know, maybe I got to go, maybe I got to retire. You know, I'm 62 years old. Maybe I could go sit on the beach, you know. It's kind of, you know, maybe North Carolina looks pretty good. Right? Just check out, look at Dave. <laughs> but what keeps me going all the time is that you never know. You never know what the Lord's going to do. We could be on that cusp of like just the Lord just calling out a bunch of people from Crompon, right? Westchester County, you, need, you know, and that keeps you, keeps you in the fight. It's the same thing in your, in your marriages, right? So you could be very close. So you, you got to have that gracious demeanor, be patient. But now, Paul, I, 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 am I starting to run a little late? I hope not. Okay, just give me a couple times. Okay, thank you. Now what Paul does here at verse 17, I feel like Paul now, he, he, he's, he's in the plane, and then he goes, right? He goes way up, 30,000 feet. And he wants to give a bigger picture to this whole, to this whole scene, right? He takes the wide view. And, and I think now at verse 17, he's talking about singleness. He's talking about marriage. He's talking about divorce, and, 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 and he's going to give you a great life lesson. If you grab this, and I grabbed this 30 years ago, and I believe it to be like just one of those life-changing verses, right? Or the next seven verses, where you get the bigger view from Paul, and he says, but as God is distributed to each one. So, so we're, in our, we're in our life situation. We, we are where we are. God has put us there. It, you know, why did I get on the five train and this lady get on the five train and I was going through a divorce and my life was a hot mess and the Lord put us together? Because the Lord did that. Amen. Thank you. Wow, that was good. We didn't even practice that. We, I am where I am because God put me there. He planted me there. I was born in the Bronx. I don't know why, but I was. <laughs> and my life is just what the Lord has given me. So he looks here, Paul says now, and, and this is really miraculous stuff. He says, as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, right? So this is all of us in the church. Let him walk. And then he says, so I ordain in all the churches. Now, now, Paul uses a word there, ordain. He's saying, this is the teaching for all the churches. He uses the word ordain. It's not just to Corinth only, but he says to all the churches. Now, the ESV, the English Standard Version, I think they use a better translation there for this one. And this is my rule in all the churches. Ah, rule. See, that gives you a bigger, a, a deeper uh, a picture of what Paul is trying to say. This is the rule for the church. To stay where you're planted. The rule for all the churches. It, it's not a suggestion. He's saying this is my rule for all the churches. And he says ordain, diazo. It means it's an institute or it's in order. And what's the order? Paul says in verse 18, were you called while you were circumcised? That's a Jewish person, right? Were you called as a Jew? Don't try and become uncircumcised. Don't, don't try and be a Gentile now, right? Or he says there, you're uncircumcised. That's a, that's a Gentile. Let him not be circumcised. You see what Paul's saying? Wherever you are, whoever you are, God didn't make a mistake. You don't have to now become something other than what you are. He says, stay the way you are. Paul's rule, one said, uh, 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 another commentator says, Paul's rule is simply this. Christians should retain the place in life assigned to them by the Lord. Retain the place where you have been called. You don't have to change who you are when you become a Christian. Paul is saying, live for Jesus Christ right where you are in whatever condition you find yourself. Because then he says, circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. It, it, either way, you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. You don't have to become a Jew now that you're a Gentile or a Gentile, you don't have to become a Jew to be a Christian. He says, no, wherever you are, stay where you are. 
He says what matters most is, verse 19, keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Here is one of those commandments. Right? This is a rule for life. Just try, because we always think it's always better on the other side, right? Grass is always greener on the other side. Right? If, if I just get out of this situation, my life is going to be better. If I get out of this marriage, my life is really going to start cooking. Right? I got to get out of New York. Right? Meanwhile, this is probably the most fertile ground in all the world. If, if you really want to do a work for God, I mean, you got, you got non-believers all over the place. What do you want to go down south for? And you go be a, a part of a, a, a billion-person church where everybody's churched. This is fun living in New York, right? This is, a, this is a job. Oh, yeah. You're my friends if you do whatever I command you, says Jesus in John 15, 14, right? I want to be a friend of Jesus. I want to follow him. Stay where you're planted. Trust the Lord right where you are. Now, by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments, 1 John 2, 3. He says, let each one remain in the same calling, verse 20, in which he was called. Keep and obey God's word right where you are. When I got saved, I was a technician. I was a technician with the phone company. And I brought Jesus right into the phone company. I, t I held Bible studies from my, from my truck. I'll never forget it. Right, Tompkins Square Park, I would have Bible studies. There would be people, homeless people would come up. Would, it was a goof. It was great. It was awesome, right? He doesn't just call us to get out right away. I lived the fate right where I was. Now, you may feel embarrassed in your line of work, and you're saying, Lord, uh, how do I get out of this job, right? You may, you know, there's been people that I know that were in very, you know, tough jobs, <laughs> doing things maybe that they felt, but the, I, I encourage you, stay right where you are until the Lord leads you out to something else. You, you follow what I'm saying? Stay where you are. Because the Lord might have people that he wants you to touch, even in those weird jobs that you might look at now as a Christian and go, oh, this is weird. No, maybe you stay right where you are for a time. And, 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 and you be used where God wants you to be used. Look at verse 21. You were called while a slave. Don't be concerned about it. If, if you can be made free, rather use it. So Paul now touches on slavery. Now, of course, slavery spoken of here is not the slavery of the 1800s. Okay? The first century slave could have a pretty good life, actually. A slave in the first century could be a ruler over a household. A first century slave, oftentimes, they didn't want to leave. Um, their, their, their boss. They didn't want to leave, so they stayed slaves. But over the 2,000 years, I think that we have come a long way from slavery, praise the Lord, and, and we can thank Christianity for, for doing that, right? So that's the slavery, but this is, the, this is a different slavery. This shows, th this is the slavery where, where the, um, uh, the, the person is, is working for someone, and he says, if you're a slave, don't, don't look to get out of your job, he's saying there. Don't look to get out right away. So this shows us that God has given us a freedom, but, we, but be very slow with running away, again, from your marriage, from a job, from a town, whatever. And he says, and, and to me, it's a great comfort here to know that God um, has, has, has me and he has you exactly where you're called to be. There's no mistakes with the Lord. And if you've been called, he says there in verse 22, he says, if you've been called at, uh, in, in the Lord while a slave, uh, you're, still, you're still free. You're the Lord's freed man. Now, notice that. The person who is in slavery as a Christian is actually the free man, right? You're, you're not in bondage because you're free in the spirit. Likewise, if you've been called uh, while free in Christ, uh, is Christ slave? So if, if you've been, uh, if, if we are free to come and go as we please, but always remember you're, you're God's slave. You're, you're, you're dedicated to him. Now, here is the honest truth. Your happiness will never be based on your circumstances. Never. When we get our heart right with the Lord, we can be so happy and blessed in any situation. 
Happiness is what comes when we're right with the Lord. But never forget, you were bought at a price. Verse 23. We're almost there. I can see you guys. I'm losing you. I know it. Some, I see some of you guys get up for a second, you know. You're like, who, man, <laughs> he's going long. Verse 23, guys. Listen, all right, I'm just two more minutes. You've been bought with a price. That, that's important, right? You have been bought with a price. What's the price? The blood of Jesus Christ. We have been bought, right? We are, we are Christ's. The slave has been freed and the free man has been made a slave because both have been purchased by Jesus Christ, right? Finally, brethren, and you guys, yeah, amen, finally. <laughs> Verse 24, <laughs> brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called, amen. right? Remain in that state. You have been called in the state of New York, all right? Don't... No, that's not what he's saying, right? <laughs> Remain in your state. No. I see this as being the totality of what Paul is teaching here. Again, remain where you are. Stay in that state. Stay in that place that the Lord has called you. Wherever you are, live for Jesus Christ. Again, this is, this is such a, a, a great life principle. And it will give you peace. It will give you that ability to to wait on the Lord, right? I, this is where I am. And, and, and you'll save yourself such a heartache of trying to go here and then go there and get out of this situation and just pump the brake. Pump the brake a little bit and say, all right, Lord, this is where you want me for now. I'm going to be used to whatever capacity you have me to be used. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to be your vessel of honor and help me to be here and, and to be useful in your hands. That's such a, a great, a great life verse, right? So live in that place and simply trust the Lord and just watch the amazing things that the, the Lord will do in you and through you uh, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's bow our hearts. Lord, again, we thank you for your word. You know exactly what we need in, in the exact right time. And so, Father, I just pray this morning for those marriages, Lord, that are struggling. I pray for both sides. I pray for the marriages, Lord, that are committed to you, but they're still struggling, Lord. Again, as we learned last week, I pray that that marriage, Lord, would just come together and love one another and be the people of God that you have called us all to be, Lord. But Lord, for the, for the, the believer in a marriage that has an unbelieving spouse, God, I pray that you would fill them with your spirit, give them patience and kindness and love, Lord. Help them to wait upon you. Help them to be peaceable. Help them to trust you. And Lord, we pray for those who don't know you at all, who need Jesus. Lord, I pray for this congregation. I pray for any that may be sitting here today and, and they're kind of like on the outside looking in. They don't feel connected. They feel separated. They want to be a part. Well, friend, if that's you, I, I would encourage you to just simply acknowledge, first and foremost, that, that you're just a sinful person. If you could do that, then you can see a God who loves you and died for you. So right where you are, how about you just say, Lord, I, I'm a sinful person. Please forgive me of my sin. And I believe that Jesus died for me. I, I want to be blood bought. I want to be a part of the church. And, 
And friend, let me tell you, it's, it's not about signing some document that you're going to be a church member or anything like that. You, you, you want Jesus in your heart. And he wants to live in your heart. So right where you're sitting, if, if, if you say, Jesus, please come into my life, I welcome you as my Lord and Savior. Do that work with the Lord right now. Right where you are, say, say Jesus, save me. I'm a mess. I need direction. I need your guidance. And so, Lord, any that may have prayed that simple prayer, Lord, I pray now that you would baptize them in the, in the Holy Spirit, that you would fill them, fill their heart, help them to know that you love them and that, and that truly, Lord, you'll never leave them. Help them to know that. And I now pray that you would fill them now with a desire to read your word, to talk to you, and to be in fellowship. We love you, Father, and we thank you for even for one person that comes into the fold, Lord. We're so grateful. We so thank you. And we all thank you, Lord, for sharing your word with us. And we pray that this word, Lord, would settle in all of our hearts, that we might walk in peace and in love. We might walk in power. So we thank you, Father, for this morning. We thank you, as always, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all, and he's in us. And we thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, we all pray. Amen. 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 Keep reading, guys. So hopefully we'll see some of you guys on Wednesday. That would be cool. And um, chapter 8. Well, not chapter 8. We've got to finish chapter 7, right? Okay. Yep. That's what I thought. A long day. All right. Let's all stand. And how about we pray? Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and may he be gracious to you. And I pray that the Lord would lift up his countenance upon you. May he smile upon you. And in this week, may he give you his, his great peace that you would walk in this world as victorious Christians. Keep looking up, guys. Keep looking for the Savior to come. Again, keep short accounts with the Lord this week. Lord, and, 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 and love him and, and bring him and his gospel to everyone that you know in any way that you can. And we all pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Have a great day. And we'll fellowship.
This morning, blessed be your holy name. Yes. Lord, we thank you for all of your many blessings in life, Lord. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a good week.